Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to have with me today Dr. Frederick W. Kagan. I reached out to some of my contacts uh, who have some intellectual credibility and some political expertise to find out who could be contacted to provide an update for everyone, me included, on the unfolding situation in Russia and Ukraine. And Dr. Frederick Kagan, his name popped up instantly. So I'll give you a bit of a bio and then we'll get right to the issue, what's happening in the Ukraine. Dr. Frederick W. Kagan is author of the 2007 report, Choosing Victory, a plan for success in Iraq. He's one of the intellectual architects of the surge strategy in Iraq. He's the director of the American Enterprise Institute's Critical Threats Project and a former professor of military history at the US Military Academy at West Point. His books range from Lessons for a Long War, American Enterprise Institute Press 2010, co-authored with Thomas Donnelly, to The End of the Old Order, Napoleon in Europe, 1805, 1801 to 1805, DeCapo Press 2006. He worked as an assistant professor of military history at West Point from 95 to 2001, and as an associate professor of military history from 2001 to 2005. Dr. Kagan holds a PhD in Russian and Soviet military history from Yale. So welcome. Thanks for agreeing to talk to me today. I very much appreciate it. I'm looking forward to this insofar as you can look forward to a discussion about such topics. And so we'll get right to the heart of the matter, I guess, uh, in the most pointed manner possible. Maybe you could give us some sense of, of what's happening right now, and then we'll move to why and what we should do about it. And But as far as you're concerned, how should we be understanding the events that are unfolding in Ukraine? Have invaded again. That's so that's the, that's the consequence of an injudicious even-handedness. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one because there's a the strong moral impulse to even-handedness and also to self-correction, right? To examine right. yourself for your own faults, which we right. seem to be more than good enough in some sense in the West. Yeah. But that can be capitalized on. And it's an interesting moral conundrum, isn't it? Because there's a time for decisive action that requires a certain level of moral certainty and that means you're not even you're not even handed under those conditions so hmm so okay so so now let, let me ask you another question that's associated perhaps on with the disinformation front there are many people around the world in the west as well claiming that in some real sense ukraine isn't an independent state it's part of russia it has been historically it's not germany it's not a country with a clear like historical existence it's a uh, and so so uh, so what 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 do you so uh, you're obviously not very happy with that argument but that is being made continually and so i know i know i'm laughing because you you mentioned germany and the the natural right. uh, you know of that of course germany is naturally a country really that right that, right that, that wasn't a that wasn't a, a, a natural thought until 1871 Right, right, right. Well, we forget about all the, uh, how oh. difficult it was for those countries we think were all who are forever around to unify themselves. E so exactly. That, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and look, so and and you know, there was historically a lot of argument about exactly what Germany was. And then of course yeah. Hitler had a you view. You mean like World War II? Right. And then of yeah. course Hitler had a view of what Germany included and it included things like Austria and Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. and you know, we we uh did persuaded the Germans that that was not the case after some considerable effort. Um, the analogy is apt because you can look at Austrians and say, well, they're Germans. Mm -hmm. Well, they speak German, they're Catholics. The dominant religion in Germany is Protestantism. Aust Austrians are largely Catholic. You can tell when you get into Austria and Southern Germany, by the way, when the when the greeting changes from Guten Tag to Grüß Gott, right? There's also no shortage of dialectical variation across the hypothetically unified German language. Exactly, like extreme dialectical variation. Exactly right. So we we've got to not just imagine that the blocks that we're used to in Europe are were always that way, 
or have been for centuries, because that's not true either. So um, then how do we but, reliably but, identify when there is a country? Well, okay, let me come back to that, because there's a straightforward mm -hmm. answer to that one. But the, it was the Kenyan um, president or prime minister, um, whom I can't believe I'm quoting approvingly, because I, I rarely approve of anything that he has to say, um, but who put this very well uh, recently in a very, very strong statement um, that, look, if we want to get into the business of talking about how uh, it should be the case that all peoples who identify ethnically with other people should be unified in country in single states, then you are signing the world up for global war on a, on a Hobbesian scale of a sort that we have never seen. Because look at, look at Africa, look at Asia. Look at Canada. How, look, well... <laughs> I'll leave that to you, Jordan. But how many countries in the world actually are drawn that way? Virtually right. none. So, okay, so the fundamental point here is, is that mere linguistic uh, historical similarity is not a sufficient condition for presuming a superordinate autonomy. Exactly. And but, so we have other mechanisms we do. to and, decide what a country is. And they're very straightforward mechanisms. We live in a world where there's a, there is a United Nations and there is a body of states and the community of states recognizes a new member by recognizing it. And we say, we recognize you as an independent state and we establish diplomatic relations with them and we give them a seat in the United Nations and then they are a state with all of the rights that any other state has. Mm -hmm. We did that with all of the states of the former Soviet Union and Russia signed up to all of that. When, to, when did that happen in, in 1991 to Ukraine? in 1991 okay. 1992 all of the states all of the former soviet states including russia were recognized as independent states established diplomatic relations with the world that's the only standard there is okay so that goes back to your in initial claim that what putin is doing was you said unprovoked unwarranted and illegal so now we've established the illegality element of that it's like he had signed agreements or, or russia had signed agreements stating that as far as they were concerned ukraine was a country among other countries and more than that they did something even more because when the soviet union fell parts of its nuclear arsenal were still in three other countries in belarus ukraine and kazakhstan and we worked very hard to persuade those countries, we, the United States and Great Britain, worked very hard to persuade those countries to give their nuclear arsenals back to Russia because we were very concerned about the threat of nuclear proliferation. So we pressed And they them, did. And, and they, they did. did. Right, and right. In return for that, in 1994, we, Britain and Russia, signed an agreement with Ukraine committing to respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine as it was recognized at the time in return for Ukraine handing back those uh, nuclear weapons. The Russians signed that treaty. The Russians have just violated a treaty that they specifically signed with Ukraine, recognizing it in its territorial integrity as it was in 1994. Who, who signed that on Russia's behalf? Yeltsin. That was Yeltsin. Okay, yeah, so Yeltsin. Putin hypothetically doesn't feel that he's bound by that agreement, but within well, the framework of international law, he is. He is. I mean, he can regard himself however he wants to, but he is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not only did Russia recognize Ukraine as a country, but it specifically recognized Ukraine in the borders that it had in 1994. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right. So, so let's go to unprovoked. Now, here's a mystery. This could have happened at any time over the last 20 years or any time into the future over the next 20 years, but it happened now. And there are accusations of all sorts flying around on the political front in the West about why now. As far as you're concerned, why now? And, and is there a lesson in the fact that it's now for us? So let me, I'll, I'll go into this a little deeper. I read a couple of papers by Victor Davis Hanson yesterday and he made a claim that was approximately the following, which is that um, the, the Democrats, for example, under Obama, talked about Russia in a negative way, but really didn't do anything about Russia, whereas Trump gave Putin 
flattery in some sense, but actually did something about the potential danger they posed. And I'm not claiming that that's a valid argument or an invalid argument. It's just something that I read when I was trying to prepare for this. Why now? Because it is being politicized like mad in, in, in yep. the West. We think, well, Putin is taking advantage of our perceived weakness. And there's partisan reasons for that. And maybe there's deeper philosophical reasons for that. Those need to be separated. As far as you're concerned, why now? And then we do need to get to also maybe why we how we stepped into this, even if it was only 20% our fault or 2%, I don't care. What did we do wrong that made this happen and happen now? So look, the, the question, the, the answer to the question, why now is very, is very hard, I think. And I, this is something that I'm also wrestling with because the, the, what, do we, what we need to explain is the invasion. That Putin has been carrying forward operations to regain control of Ukraine since 2014. Um, he has been pursuing hybrid warfare approaches, pursuing informational operation approaches in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He's put various forms of military pressure on Ukraine from his occupied territories. Um, right. So it's not exactly now. This is right. actually an extension of a process that's been occurring for a long time. It's an inflection in that process. Now, okay. so what we need okay. to explain this particular inflection, which is a huge inflection, um, but that's actually rather hard, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... There's no simple partisan or straightforward explanation uh, to why Putin decided that he needed to invade now, which is the question that is that preoccupies me as someone who's focused on Putin's calculus. Well, the best explanation I've heard so far, and it goes along with this gradualist idea in some sense, is that part of what Putin did while he was attempting to wrest back control of Ukraine, let's say, is build a military presence on the border. Yeah. And then the fact that you've done that actually changes the situation substantially. If you're gonna build, if you're much more likely to shoot someone with a gun if you happen to be pointing, holding it and pointing it at them as a precursor. And so you could see how a gradualist approach and his initial idea might've just been, well, we'll build up the military to put even more pressure on the West and to continue this gradualist approach. But once it's there, the situation changes. And then it could be, in some sense, relatively small and relatively random events that precipitate it at any given moment. So I think it's quite possible that something like that occurred. Um, there's a lot of technical details about, so I, I want to say on the air to you what I've been saying to other people that I talk to. I got this wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we made a forecast. I and the ISW Russia team made a forecast um, beginning in uh, November and then carrying forward until very recently that Putin would not launch this huge invasion. Mm -hmm. And we, we were wrong. Obviously, he did. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I you know, as a matter of analytical integrity, I feel it necessary to say to people explicitly, yes, we were wrong in our forecast. And we've been spent a lot of time trying to understand and think about why we were wrong and what lessons we can learn from that. Um, here's one of the reasons why we were wrong. Or let me say, this is one of the reasons why we forecast that he would not do this. Because when you look actually at the technical details of the way that he arrayed his forces around Ukraine, we were watching that and saying, this is gonna stink this military operation that he's conducting. He's not well set up to do this. Mm -hmm. Surely his professional military officers are going to tell him that this is a bad idea. And it turns out that we were wrong that he would be persuaded by that reality, but we were right that it was a bad idea. Because mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. problems that he's now encountering, we actually did predict that he would have the problems that he's now encountering if he conducted this operation. Okay, okay. so it isn't obvious what precipitated this, and there isn't an obvious moral to derive from the story, there, but... Yeah, but there I, are errors in it. And, and OK, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, we'll get to errors. But I, you know, mm -hmm. before we get to our own errors, because, you know, I've got to tell you, Jordan, oh. one of my one of the things that I'm very focused on is you need to start by blaming the enemy for things the enemy does. I'm happy to talk okay. about what our responsibilities are here. But this was all Putin's decision. Yeah, um, well, I'd, and I'd, I'm actually more interested in, in in some sense now what our responsibilities are going forward. OK, right. So so because that's the crucial issue. But and I'd like to hear. I when I commented about mistakes, then I was thinking you said his troops were badly positioned, his military machine yeah. was badly positioned. And so that might mean he was setting it up for other reasons, but yes. defaulted to this. Right. What, Why did that happen? What is the situation he's in now? 
because well, well, he's, I, he's not finding allies at that rapid a rate, let's say. No, no, he's not finding really oh. allies at all. Look, the first thing I want to say is I think it's quite possible that he decided to launch this invasion because the intent of the mobilization, I think it is possible, the intent of the mobilization was to intimidate both the Ukrainians and the West into surrendering without having to invade. And that he, he therefore, you know, allowed his military guys to set up a deployment that didn't make sense for an invasion, but was great for threatening. One of the things that happened, the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for at least one thing that it's done, actually for a few things that it's done, deserves some criticism for other things. But for the first time in history that I'm aware of, the Biden administration fought a counter hybrid warfare campaign back against the Russians. And as they became, as the Biden administration became aware of Russian preparations to conduct a coup d'etat in Kyiv, they told the Ukrainians about it and they told the world about it. As they became aware of multiple Russian preparations to conduct false flag attacks or stage Ukrainian provocations or various other things that would have given Putin informational cover and created a who really knows effect in the minds of people in the West, they blew, the Biden administration blew every one of those operations. Okay, so why is that a hybrid warfare response on, on Biden's part and not just, not just, I don't mean just, but not just the utility of straightforwardness and honesty as a response to disinformation and propaganda? It's both. Or is that, is the, it's both. Okay. It's both. Why because both? We can mm -hmm. wage war with the truth because we're not trying to lie. Putin is trying to create a false universe. Putin is trying to create a fictitious universe and the Biden administration punctured that. I'm calling it hybrid warfare because they reacted to, first of all, Putin engaged in violence and which makes it you know, politically motivated violence, which makes it warfare. And he, his guys were conducting deliberate information campaigns to support specific preparations for military activities. And the Biden administration engaged game for game with them on a very tactical level. So it wasn't just sort of blanket telling the truth. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. finding- Strategic yeah, as well. Strategic and tactical, blowing all and of this- And informed. Cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can, by the way, see, I have a little bit artef artifact that suggests that this was true because Putin hold, held one of his weirdly publicly staged, you know, National Security Council meetings on uh, Monday. And one of the things that happened was he absolutely humiliated the guy who is the head of his foreign intelligence agency that would have been responsible for a lot of these operations. I mean, he humiliated the guy in public in a way that we've never seen him do before. And I think he probably was genuinely angry that the guy had allowed the Biden administration to get inside all of these operations. And I, I am hypothesizing that Putin decided in the face of having all of this cover blown, decided that he was just going to go for it instead of waiting for this guy, Nadishkin, or somebody else to get something. Putin just said, okay, screw it. We've got the forces. I'm tired of this. We're just going to do this. And I don't care that we don't have the informational cover. So frustration and anger in response, possibly to the success of the Biden administration, sort of defeating all the informational stuff. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, that's an, in that's an interesting uh, explanation for a tipping point and certainly not an expected one. So... So you've covered unprovoked, unwarranted, and illegal, I would say. And we've covered territorial ambitions or political ambitions. And we've talked a lot about reconstituting the Soviet empire, let's say, or, or something approximating that. Um, do you think it's worth... So, so let's switch to something else. Is what he's... Uh, how, how do you assess the success of what he's doing from a military and a political perspective? Has he miscalculated... Uh, what what's the situation on the ground in the Ukraine? How are the Ukrainians resisting? Uh, how are how are other countries responding? Like, what's the situation in your estimation? So, I'm going to lead by saying uh, the Russian, you know, the Russian military is so much stronger than the than the Ukrainian military writ large that the odds remain high that the Russian military will be able ultimately to overwhelm the Ukrainian defenses and take control of Kyiv and so forth. I, I don't want to offer an optimistic take here because we're still early days in this war and the power imbalance is just so great. But <clears throat> that having been said, 
I would never have expected to be sitting here four days into the Russian military operation with Russian troops just messing around on the outskirts of Kyiv, just finally getting into Kharkiv and struggling all up and down. I would never have expected that to happen, except that we, we did expect it to be a mess when they tried to do an invasion with the force packages that they had put together, especially those that are attacking Kyiv and, uh, and Kharkiv. So a few things have gone on. One is this was a stupid way of, of, of preparing for an invasion if you were serious about an invasion. I give you In all that. In what way? Yeah, yeah give yeah. some details. I okay, think that'd so, be interesting. So here's the thing. Um, mechanized maneuver warfare is very complicated undertaking. Logistically. Well, yes, logistically, but even more than that, in terms of command and control, um, when you are a commander and you've got multiple battalions, mechanized battalions moving down multiple axes of advance, sort of driving down different roads to different targets rapidly, keeping track of all of that is very hard. Understanding what they're doing is very hard. Figuring out how to support them is very hard. They need artillery support. They need air support. They do need logistics support. You need to tell them what to do as they get the particular, or as they run into problems. It's a lot of burden on a commander to keep track of a lot of subordinates. So the solution for as long as there's been mechanized warfare is that you build forces where you never have more than two or three or maximum four direct subordinate units like that. So battalions get grouped into regiments or brigades, which are at the same echelon uh, in an organizational structure. And there will be not more than, than four uh, maneuvering battalions or mechanized battalions within a mechanized regiment or a mechanized brigade. And then brigades and regiments get grouped into divisions. So there's not gonna be more than three or four brigades or regiments in a division. And then the divisions are grouped into larger uh, organizations. And this is the way the US military is organized and it's the way the Russian military is organized formally. But the weird thing is that when they put these masses of forces into Belarus and into Western Russia that are now attacking Kyiv, and when they built up forces opposite Kharkiv, they didn't move entire regiments or brigades, let alone entire divisions. They pulled individual battalion, what they call battalion tactical groups, BTGs. They pulled individual BTGs from all across Russia. The guys in Belarus actually came from I did 10 or 15 different regiments and brigades in the Russian Far East. And did they do that to not weaken those divisions and brigades where they were already located? No, no, because they're most of this, all the stuff in Belarus is coming in a place where the Russians don't need to worry about, the Chinese are not invading the Russian Far East. So the Russians could have taken whole regiments or brigades from the Far East if they'd wanted to, and they didn't. There are various, I can offer various technical explanations for why they might not have. But the point is that they, they put together what we, we're, we're calling just sort of collection of cats and dogs of battalions wung together from a whole bunch of other parent units, not organized coherently, even on the spot, as far as we can tell, into clear mm -hmm. regiment brigade structures and all like that. And then they just sort of told them, go down, you know, drive down the road and go take Kiev. Okay, that gets you the kind of mess that they have now where they try to, they, you know, individual battalion tactical groups drive down and then they get stopped, but then there's not a good coordination so that there's not an immediate other battalion that can take over and flank and keep the attack moving. There are all kinds of ways of dealing with the defenses the Ukrainians are putting up and the Russians are not using them. And I, I think that that has a lot to do with the organization of the Russian forces that is just, it was just crazy as an organization for a mechanized operation like this. And, and then, then they, Putin assumed that just brute force numbers in some sense would overcome that. Possibly. That, dis, that disarray in, in organizational structure. Possibly, but, it, but I think another answer goes to your second question. The Ukrainians are fighting like lions. They, they, are, they are fighting like heroes. It's, it's unbelievable the determination with which I thought they would fight. I mean, I know mm -hmm. Ukrainians and I, I thought that they would fight. Um, they are fighting re hard and effectively. I'm mm -hmm. certain that Putin did not expect them to. Okay, so he's having a lot more trouble locally than yes. he might have expected for a multitude of reasons. Right. Poor organization to begin with, which 
which seems in keeping with the notion that the troops were put there as an intimidation rather than as a reliable military awesome. force for an invasion. Yep, sure, sure. All of this is provisional. And also the Ukrainians are entrenching and fighting back with a ferocity that was unexpected. To him, well, yeah. they have more to, to lose in some sense than the Russians have to gain. So yeah. that's always dangerous. That's a dangerous yeah. inequality in um, morality in warfare. And that's not to be underestimated. And so what's happening on the international front in response to the cohesiveness of the yeah. response to the invasion? This has been very um, heartening and it goes to the other one of the other reasons why I thought Putin wouldn't do this because the international community is rallying um, and we I, we can have frustrations with the way individual states are responding to specific requests and so forth and I have been frustrated by that um, as everybody else has been but the truth is in if you get out of the time dilated world we're in, in which if something doesn't happen five seconds from now, then it's taking a long time. We're talking about within three to four days, we've got the Russians being partially kicked out of SWIFT. We've got sanctions on the Russian central bank. We've got the Germans for the first time since the second world war directly sending lethal aid to the Ukrainians. We've got virtual unanimity in condemning the Russian attack. Are there Even, any exceptions? Yes, and, and, yes. and I want to go back to SWIFT as well. Okay, yes, there okay. are exceptions. Bashar al-Assad continues to demonstrate what an evil slime ball he actually is and how much he owes the Russians because he immediately recognized the Russian recognition of Donbass, of Donetsk and Luhansk. And for those that don't know, he is? The dictator of Syria who has been conducting his own little genocide there with Russian active assistance. Right, so he's just the kind of ally you'd hope the Russians would have. Exactly. Uh, I haven't tracked this. I think the Venezuelans have made good noises. Again, um, when you know Maduro's on your side, you ought to be thinking hard about um, your life choices. Um, and the, the Iranian, um, what they call the axis of resistance, I think, was very prompt in recognizing the, uh, the recognition of the public. So I and the Iranians are generally focused on blaming NATO for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, but other than that, even Xi Jinping mm -hmm. could not bring himself to veto the UN Security Council resolution condemning the invasion. He just abstained. Mm -hmm. And we can- Right, it, so that's a big deal. It's a big deal. It, it mm -hmm. tells you that what Putin has done is even Xi is going, you know, Vova, I'm not sure that I can actually support you on this, the way you've done this. There's just mm -hmm. no cover. He's, Putin has given himself no cover. And so Hungary, even the Hungarians supported uh, kicking him out of SWIFT. And so let's go into the SWIFT issue to some degree, because yeah. people won't know what that is and so why it's important. It's very complicated and it is in some respects overblown. Mm -hmm. um, SWIFT is a, a, a European consortium that is the means by which banks communicate with one another to do bank to bank transfers. And if you are kicked out of SWIFT, then you have to find other ways of communicating with banks in order to do bank-to-bank -bank transfers. There are other ways. But it's harder. It's much harder. It's much more, mm -hmm. it's much slower. It's more, it's, it, it, is a, it introduces all kinds of friction into bank-to-bank -bank transactions, which is important because the Russians rely on dollar reserves uh, for their reserves and having when they have challenges interacting with the dollar market globally it's a big problem for them and getting them interfering with their ability to use swift uh makes that much harder for them so it makes it harder for them to do what so they can't it makes get it harder access for them to money to move, to move money around including mm -hmm. to regain you know reclaim money that is abroad or to move money to buy things or various other things that states do and that individuals try to do using banks and so on it just throws a huge amount of sand in the gears of all of that. Do the Russians use SWIFT to move money between the banks in Russia, or is that all international? Uh, I don't know how they do it in, within, within Russia. Okay. I'm sure they can work that out internally, but the, right. it's getting, getting abroad is a, whole other, is a whole other story. Okay. But important okay. as SWIFT is, actually, the sanctions on the Russian central bank are even more important. Because SWIFT is just a means of communication, and it is important, and I'm glad that we've 
you know, gotten gotten people around on that for the most part. But we've we're you know we've got uh, the EU imposing sanctions on the central bank. Um, that's a big deal. That's a very why? big deal because what that does that mean? In, it and makes why it, is it it can make it hard to impossible for the Russian central bank actually to play on the dollar market and to use engage in the dollar economy, which is a problem because the global economy remains fundamentally a dollar economy. And mm -hmm. as the ruble is predictably collapsing, as this is going on, mm -hmm. the Russian, in fact, there's a joke going around Russians, <clears throat> Russians from the Soviet days and even before have a, have a very dark sense of humor mm -hmm. and they excel at that, <clears throat> as I'm sure you know. But one joke going around as soon as the invasion began was, um, uh, could you kindly tell us that before you invade somebody else the next time so we can buy dollars? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so Russians need dollars and uh, sanctioning the central bank makes it hard to impossible for the Russian government to deal in dollars and to interact in that way. And how, how long how long will it take the consequences of that to unfold um, in, in some way that actually bites, particularly on the military front? Well, I mean, so, OK, the problem is I don't know that it will bite on the military front um, because we need to keep something in mind that a lesson that we learned from the Soviet Union, a dictatorship can generally do any one thing that it decides to do. When you're running a country, the resources that are available to you, sanctions notwithstanding, you can usually choose any one thing and actually make that happen. So the Soviet military threat, for example, reached its height at the same time as the Soviet economy began to go into terminal decline in the 1980s. Those two facts were probably related to one another and with some causality, by the way. Putin has a similar phenomenon here. I think he probably can keep his military going. But what's going to happen is the Russian economy will collapse. I don't know exactly what that means, but will be badly mm -hmm. harmed um, it, at some point. Okay. You know, now, pretty do soon. you think now do you think that so? OK, so you, you can imagine two consequences of that. One would be that support for Putin within the country vanishes and the demonstrations that we've already seen start to increase in scope. And I suppose the other possibility is you know, bombing people into submission, so to speak, often produces much more resistance than anyone attempts or it intends or assumes. And so is there any possibility that these sanctions might backfire and increase support for Putin? Or do you think that disintegration into chaos uh, possibilities is more probable? The sanctions are, so the, the last thing that I wanna flag for you, which is part of our own self reflection on why we got it wrong is we assumed that Putin would prepare his people for a big war. We assumed mm -hmm. that before he attacked, he would have spent days, if not weeks, telling his people basically that he was going to have to fight a big war and here's why, and that they were going to suffer, but it was going to be necessary and good for them. And yep. he did the exact opposite. As he was getting ready to invade, the Russian officials were lampooning the West as we kept saying that he's about to invade. They were talking to the Russian people and laughing at us and saying, look at these stupid Westerners who think we're going to invade. That's ridiculous. Um, he did nothing to prepare his people for this war. And that's been evident. And the protests that you're seeing and the word that is coming out, even from the sectors near Kharkiv, from near the border near Kharkiv, where the Russians concentrated all of these forces. I've seen Western interviews uh, with talking to Russians near the border who saying we had no idea. We were shocked when this thing kicked off. So he's done mm -hmm. nothing to prepare his people for the war. Which is why have you ever seen anything like these no. demonstrations? Okay, so let's we could talk about that a little bit because it's not like we're accustomed to seeing demonstrations in Russia. Not on this scale. I mean, I, that's not a thing. Not on and this so, scale. So, 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 how do you you account for that? At least in part by the fact that this is a terrible shock to people and that they can see that it's going to cost them. They feel betrayed by this, but also, it's no trivial thing to demonstrate in a place like Russia. I mean. That's right. You put you put yourself at some risk here, but not very much by doing that. But there, right. it's it's like he's reportedly already arrested sixteen hundred people for demonstrating, and those people are certainly having a very hard time of it in prison, um, and will probably never emerge again. I I would predict, and he's I think he's going to have to get in the business of killing a lot of Russians um, if this protracts. They're not going to blame us for we are not going to be the target of the anger for the sanctions and the economic suffering at this point. 
but it's it's not just the sanctions and i want to be clear about this this and this is the other part of why i thought he'd have to prepare his people lots of polls show that russians see america as an enemy and a threat and all of that kind of stuff he spent 20 years getting russians uh, to believe that and of course there's the soviet hangover of a lot of comfort in russia uh, you know it believing that russians have not seen ukraine as an enemy and all mm -hmm. of the language mm -hmm. that he's been using about these are our fraternal slavic brothers and they we need to bring them back to the fold and all of that kind of stuff that's been the messaging and he's been talking about you know, we need to remove this illegal junta that's in Kiev. He's got a whole narrative about how this really isn't a war against right, the Ukrainian right. people. Russians but now are not it is. that stupid. Now it is. They're blowing mm -hmm. up apartment blocks and stuff. Now he's trying to keep that from his people. But again, Russians are not that stupid. And mm -hmm. they are they are understanding that this is a war against Ukraine. And that a lot of Russians, I think, are just, why are we fighting Ukraine? Why are we attacking Ukraine? You tell me the Americans are the enemy. So okay. insofar, insofar as they are their Slavic brothers, this is now tantamount to a civil war. Right. Right. And, right. And, if yeah. that narrative was originally true. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it, he's just he's totally failed to prepare anybody informationally for this. And that is one of the things that is generating this this outrage in Russia over this unprovoked war of aggression against a, a, a brother Slavic state that did not attack Russia and wasn't threatening Russia and where there are no Americans. Because again, you could, I mean, you could tell the Russian people that the Americans are the threat, but there are no Americans in Ukraine. We're not fighting Americans in Ukraine. So uh, he has a problem. And I think it's going to- Many, many problems. Many problems, by the yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. so, okay, so let's, we're, we're, let's move to future actions. Yeah. So the the West is united, well, the world is united, except for the exceptions that you already described. And Putin is having a lot of trouble on the ground. And as far as you're concerned, he wasn't well prepared either on the propaganda or the military front. And he's going to suffer substantial economic costs. And so this, at the moment, this does not look like it's going well for him. Okay, so we could be happy about that, except that there are also nuclear weapons. And that's always something to think about. What, what, how do we not, what's the right reaction? It's not an underreaction, it's not an overreaction. Yeah. What, what do you think is an intelligent pathway forward as far as you're concerned? And are you, do you feel comfortable in even detailing out such a thing? Sure. Yeah, I'm comfortable with it. I, I, there's, you know, we, we, don't, we don't do secrets very well. And that's, um, you know, this is, this is straightforward. Um, so as I, I guess I meant confident in your knowledge about making such a such an such well, a uh, listen, suggestion. Let's as, say. You, as you can see, I'm comfortable making forecasts and recommendations with the possibility that they'll be wrong, and I'll accept the consequence if they are. That's it's my job to do that. Um, so right now we're doing the most important thing that we should be doing, which is rushing the most important kinds of defensive weapons to Ukraine uh, as much as we can. Um, we need to try to help the Ukrainians save their country if there's any way for them to do that. Um, and we need to bleed the Russian military badly um, if we can't. I am co very confident that there will be a Ukrainian insurgency if Putin overcomes the uh, Ukrainian conventional forces. And this can turn into Ukraine, uh, Putin's Afghanistan war. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we should absolutely help the Ukrainians win that as quickly as possible. Um, and that that will be world changing. We we need to do that. Um, and what sort of defensive we weapons do we're you sending? Think are so we're sending primarily what they need are anti tank uh, weapons, which are mainly javelin, anti tank, uh, man portable. You could fire them from your shoulder um, missiles, um, and Stinger um, anti aircraft missiles. Again, you know, we we sent Stingers to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s, um, and it did fearful mm -hmm. harm to the to the Soviets, and we're sending such stingers here too, and the Ukrainians are using them to good effect against uh, Russian aircraft today. Um, those are the most important things we need to do. I'm sure that there's also sort of basic ammunition and stuff that we uh, need to send, also humanitarian supplies, and there have been increasing, uh, there are organizations, I don't have a list right now, but there are organizations getting together to send humanitarian relief to, to Ukraine. I encourage everybody to do that. Um, as long as there is an, an independent Ukraine, it's going to need a lot of help because the Russians are doing fearful damage to it and will do more. So that's what people people can do that at a local yeah. level. Yeah. And yeah. maybe yeah. we could put some links in the description of this video. I'd yeah. like links from you for recommended papers okay. so that people could familiarize themselves, but also anything you could provide us that would, would help 
in that practical sense would be useful as well. Okay, you bet. Uh, okay. Start, yep, right. Start with our websites, understandingwar.org and criticalthreats.org. Um, and we we have daily and, and, and sometimes several times a day updates of exactly what's going on uh, with maps and a lot of detail. Um, so, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to find you some links for organizations that are, that are doing good work here. Okay. Um, I'll name one. Spirit of America uh, has, has historically done really great work, and they've got a, a Ukraine program going. Um, so we're doing all of that stuff, and that's great. Um, we're going to bring a lot of economic pain on Putin, and that's great. Um, look, a wounded bear is a very dangerous animal. Mm -hmm. And we must not be complacent about this. I want to bound what I'm worried about here for, for your listeners, okay? We're not going to get into a global thermonuclear exchange that ends the world. Why not? Because as crazy as Putin might or might not be, he's not that crazy. Why do you believe that? Because, the, because we are not going to do anything that is going to put the survival of Russia at stake in such a clear and okay, fundamental way. Okay, so that's way. part of the issue of a measured response is that, so the measured response is to to insist upon the territorial integrity of the of Ukraine. Right, and that's it. I mean, we're not and going to invade, it. we're not going to attack Russia. We're not going to, we never were going to attack Russia. We're not going to attack Russia. And we're certainly not going to invade. I mean, you know, we know anything from history. Do you, do you want to invade, drive from Warsaw to Moscow again? Uh, no one who's ever tried that has enjoyed it. So we were never going to do that, and we're never going to do that. We're not going to put the survival of the Russian of Russia at stake. Putin is not going to uh, end the world um, because we're never going to back him into a corner uh, like that. That hard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I am worried about an, a conventional expansion of this conflict. Yeah, well, because I was wondering when you were saying we start to fun funnel in defensive weapons. Well, at what point? Are well, now we should be the global community, not the United States, to the degree that that's possible. And then, but it's still at what point does the funneling of defensive weapons become active engagement in the war process? I mean, is that means the movement of troops, I would presume, from other countries, that maybe that's a dividing well, well, line? Well, no, I mean, no one is sending, no other countries are sending troops into Ukraine. And you, and you think that's, an, that's appropriate, certainly at the time and perhaps into the future? I'm going to tell you the the I'm going to tell you what I'm worried about before I say that that that's appropriate indefinitely. Look, um, we know what Putin did to Syria. We know in Syria that Russian Russia was using precision guided munitions to attack bread lines and hospitals in Syria. We know that he was supporting what the war called siege and starve campaigns to compel communities to surrender by literally cutting them off from food and water and watching them die until they surrendered. These are things that Russia did in Syria and it's very well documented. In fact, I mean, it, like the Doctors Without Borders and other organizations had to stop announcing the locations of their medical facilities in Syria because the Russians were using those lists which are supposed to be do not strike lists as target lists. They did that in Syria. If they start doing that in Ukraine, and I'm very worried about the fact that the Russians are bringing weapons toward Kharkiv of the sort that one uses to exterminate city blocks in short order. I'm hoping that that's not what they're gonna do with those weapons if they do anything with them. The West is gonna ask, have to ask itself, if the Russians go that route in Ukraine, are we actually just gonna stand by and watch? I don't have, I'm not going to offer you an answer. I'm just right. telling so you that's, that's going to be a, that's that's a, that's a decision, decision, decision to take down the road. Take if, mm -hmm. if they go there, and I hope that they don't. Um, but be, as long as they don't go there, I'm, we're not going to see Western troops going into Ukraine, and I'm not going to advocate for that. And I'm not, I'm not getting into, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should do that. Mm -hmm. um, now, we should do everything we can to help the Ukrainians defend themselves. Putin has said that it is an act of aggression to help the Ukrainians defend themselves, which is not true. Uh, but he has asserted that. And he has threatened to attack the countries that are helping the Ukrainians. Might he attack mm -hmm. Poland? Yes, he might. He might attack Poland. I can absolutely see Russian missile strikes or airstrikes into Poland or into Hungary or into Romania or into any of the states that are, which would be an attack on NATO territory, which would activate Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. 
which would mean what would have to happen? Well, it would mean that that we and all of the other NATO member states would need to vote to activate Article 5, which I would hope that we would do. Um, and then what we would do, what I would like to see us do is what we are now doing, which is, or an acceleration of what we are now doing, which is sending American military power and also British and French and other countries military power to the NATO borders, to the Eastern NATO borders in a defensive posture to defend. There's no, no one is talking about attacking, but we have to be prepared to defend against these sorts of things. The complexity will come if the Russians actually begin rocketing or firing missiles into Poland, the defense against that is counter battery fire. And at a certain point, you do start right. to have to shoot back, shoot back at Russian you know, the missile The launchers. line between de defense and offense right. is quite blurry. Well, it's not in a legal sense. This is, you know, legally, that okay. would not be an offensive action. The Russians would have engaged in an act of war against Poland. And Poland and NATO would, Poland would then have a right under international law to defend itself. And NATO would have a right under Article 5 and collective security agreements to come to Poland's defense in that regard. No one is going to talk about a ground invasion of Belarus or Russia or Kaliningrad or anything. I am confident that NATO will act, if it acts militarily at all, in an entirely defensive fashion and for the, simply for the purpose of eliminating known imminent threats of attack to member states. Um, but no one is going to talk about an invasion and, and we're not going to do that. But we are going to have to change our force posture very fundamentally, which is going to have all kinds of ripple effects, because this, this is not a short term crisis. This, the threat that Putin is manifesting is, is a threat that's going to be here as long as Putin is here. So we're going to have to be prepared to defend Poland and Romania and the Baltic states from Russian, the Russian conventional threat. For the first time since the end of the Cold War, we're going to have to be prepared to defend against the risk of a Russian mechanized attack on NATO member states. The US defense budget is not built to do that. The US force posture is not structured to do that. Our national security documents are not built to do that. We're gonna to have to change all of that. And we're gonna to have to rebuild some defense capability and we're gonna to have to spend more on defense because China hasn't gone away. We've spent more than 90 minutes here talking about Russia. We haven't talked about China, which is great because I'm not a China expert. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't reduce the threat that China poses to Taiwan or, or the requirements to beef up our capabilities in the Pacific. By the way, we've got problems in the Middle East still going on. We haven't talked about that either. And we've got an ongoing war series of wars in the Middle East that can engage us at any moment. We've got to get serious about our defenses. And I can tell you right now that the defense budget that we're operating under is insufficient by a lot. And no one wants to hear this, no one wants to spend more on defense, but it's the world is at war. So let's let's sum up a bit and then let's see if there's anything else we need to cover. I, we've, it's been a pretty comprehensive discussion and, and uh, We've we've talked about an unprovoked, unwarranted and illegal attack by Russia on Ukraine, which is by all indications a sovereign state by legally and otherwise. Um, we've talked about why the Russians might have been motivated to do that historically and also proximally. Uh, we've talked about the situation on the ground and internationally. The Russians are having more trouble than they might have uh, predicted on both fronts. And I suppose that's good news in some sense for the rest of the world and for Ukraine. We've talked about the pitfalls associated with that. We've talked about how this might move forward and should move forward, partly in terms of supporting Ukraine's and the Ukrainians' attempts to defend themselves and then what might occur after that. You've talked about your belief that the world response, because I won't call it the Western response, the world response is likely to be measured and careful and that as far as you're concerned at the moment, you don't see radical danger in this tit for tatting up to some ultimate exchange. And so, well, I'm wondering if there's anything else you think it's, it would be useful to bring to the attention of people at this particular point. We can always have a conversation like this again as things unfold. Anything else you think that, that is necessary for people to understand right now? I think that um, I, I just want to end by uh, saluting the heroic Ukrainians who are defending themselves valiantly uh, against this attack 
uh, salute all of those who help them. And I will sign off as I will uh, going forward while this war is going on and while there's a free Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine. Well, thanks very much for talking to me today, and we'll get this up as soon as we possibly can. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. By this pasta, an, um, an anti-German activist, anti-Nazi activist rather, who said, first they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for me and by then there was no one left to speak out for me. That is what they are seeking to do to us.